Welcome to Act in Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. This episode, Eric Cohn sits with Neil Chilson, Research Fellow for Technology and Innovation at the Stand Together Foundation, to discuss his new book, Getting Out of Control, Emergent Leadership in a Complex World. Instead of chasing control of people, systems, and protocols, Chilson explains how leaders must pursue the art of influence to lead and win. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at actin.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Neil Chilson is a senior research fellow for technology and innovation at Stand Together, where he spearheads the Stand Together community's efforts to foster an environment that encourages innovation and the individual and societal progress it makes possible. He is the author of the book, Getting Out of Control, Emergent Leadership in a Complex World, which we'll be discussing today. Prior to his current role, Chilson was the Federal Trade Commission's chief technologist, and in that capacity, he focused on understanding the economics of privacy, convening a workshop on informational injury, and establishing the FTC's blockchain working group, among other things. Prior to his appointment, he was an advisor to then-acting FTC Chairman Maureen Olhausen. In both roles, he advised Chairman Olhausen and worked with commission staff on nearly every major technology-related case report, workshop, and proceeding. He practiced telecommunications law at Wilkinson Barker Nauer, LLP, before joining the FTC in January of 2014. Jolson is a regular contributor to multiple news outlets, including The Washington Post, USA Today, and Newsweek. He holds a law degree from George Washington University Law School, a master's in computer science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and received his bachelor's degree in computer science from Harding University. Neil Chilson, welcome to Act in Line. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. So Neil, I've shamelessly stolen this opening question for all of our guests who have books from Jonah Goldberg and his podcast. What's your book about? <laughs> I was just listening to one of your other podcasts, uh, interviewing actually, I think, uh, one of your own who has a recent book out. Uh, and I noticed I recognized the question. Yes, so, uh, yes. so, so my book, you know, which is entitled, you know, uh, getting out of control and emergent leadership in a complex world is about how to deal with the increasing complexity that I think the modern world has brought us. Um, I think, in technology and law, and even in our personal life, uh, our main strategy often is to get control, uh, to try to get control of all this this craziness that's going on around us. And uh, that grasping for control not only is extremely uh, stressful in personal life and can be quite counterproductive in public life, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, it, it it can undermine the very purposes that we're trying to get at, and uh, it can reduce the benefits of the very complex systems, the complexities that we're benefiting from. And so my book is to, is, the point of my book is to offer some strategies uh, to first describe the challenges that we're facing, um, describe why uh, there can be order without control, without somebody in control, what we call, what I talk about as emergent order, and then what this means for some of the strategies that we can use in public policy and in our own personal lives uh, in order to address this feeling that things are out of control. I'd like your description of in in what way is the world getting more complex? I mean, probably all of our definition of that, but curious for your observations for how is our world becoming more complex? What are the forces driving that? Well, there's many different ones, but um, technology is the area that I spend a lot of time, my uh, my personal and professional life in. And that is certainly an area that has gotten more embedded in our lives over time. And technology, uh, communications technology, social media, um, the internet generally, and all the business models that it's enabled uh, have brought the ability to streamline a lot of the processes that, that we've used in the past. They've made it easier to outsource certain things. And so, but what that means is that our supply chains, this is a common topic today, uh, have gotten very complicated. 
So when I when I purchase something, uh, you know, at the local Walmart, it, it's it, it it's the work of millions and millions of people. Now this has always been true. Um, I think since you know at least since the essay I pencil right, uh, and before that, uh, the the idea that the raw materials for things come from lots of different places are true. But now they come much faster, right? So so that a disruption in some place that's very far away can cause a, a, a disruption to us or a, an improvement in some place that's very far away can cause a very quick improvement to us. And so what this means is that lots of things are changing. And uh, and even when there are changes for the better, uh, it can be a bit disorienting uh, to, to us as humans who are trying to keep up with all of it. And so um, that's one of the ways, you know, the ability for us to hear news about something that happened across the world almost instantaneously means that we now see a lot of chaos uh, that maybe we wouldn't have seen in the past, or we see a lot of negative news events that we wouldn't have seen in the past when our main source of news was maybe a, a weekly newspaper or, a, you know, maybe even a daily newspaper that was published in our town. So, so I think it's it's in part that the world itself has gotten more complex, but also that we have become more aware of the complexity that already existed in the world because communication comes at us so much faster. Yeah, I was I was just going to ask you about the the rapidity of information because I I think that is a major contributor to, and I would agree with you that the world has gotten more complex, and I think in a lot of the ways that you you've highlighted uh, the ability to get information much faster than we did prior to the advent of particularly, um, you know, the certainly the internet, <clears throat> particularly social media, uh, also has this effect, I feel, where it makes us feel like things that happen 3,000 miles away are in our backyard. You know, I, I've made this point in this podcast a number of times. If you go back to the Saurabh Amari, David French uh, wars, uh, the French-Iranian wars from 2019, Saurabh Ramari is in New York City, and, and what his triggering incident is this uh, is Drag Queen Story Hour in Sacramento, California, which it strikes me if you go back 60, 70 years, you tell someone in Peoria that there's something like Drag Queen Story Hour going on in Sacramento, the reaction would probably be like, that's really weird, and then you would move on with your day. Um, so that that how much do you think we're influenced by that rapidity of information, and that it has really been revelatory of the kind of chaos that has always existed in the world. It just makes it feel more imminent, and that's what we're dealing with. Yeah, I think that's a big part of the challenge, right? So uh, in some ways, the internet has turned the entire world into a little neighborhood um, where people can gossip. People are gossiping about each other, but there are people who are don't have similar life experiences at all in many ways. And so um, the basic type of there's a real challenge here to the basic formation of community um, uh, in that we we are treating people who are very far outside of our geographic location or our, our maybe our, our personal experience as if they're members of our same community in the same way and that we expect this, we hold them to the same norms and standards that maybe we have for our, our, our local community and that and that that's a challenge for the process of building communities. Um, it's also a big opportunity. Uh, there's there's many ways that the internet can make it possible to build communities that aren't restricted merely to the people who are, you know, geographically close to you. But it does bring a big challenge in that uh, it's kind of it's more up to us to shape our communities uh, in a way that we as a society don't have a ton of experience with. And so building that experience. And in especially understanding that that process is one that emerges rather than one that is commanded and controlled, I think is really uh, vital to us being able to adapt to this uh, quickly changing world. That's a perfect opportunity to dovetail into the concept of emergent order. Now, I know a lot of our listeners will be familiar with that already, those who've, who've read their Hayek. Um, but for anyone who's not familiar with it, what is emergent order? So emergent order is the idea that uh, a system can generate just based on the interactions between its low level elements, um, uh, an overarching order that is not designed by any one of the participants in the system, uh, but which serves the interests of many of the participants in the system. And so uh, that 
there's tons of examples of this in nature. Uh, you re, you referred to Hayek. He uses the term spontaneous order, which uh, is much more common, I think, because Hayek originated it in the economic, when you're talking about economic processes, market processes, which are obviously back to that, uh, the pencil, uh, I pencil essay, an example of emergent order where many different people pursuing their own interests are creating a process in which um, prices reflect the and, and drive the the production of the goods that are needed to to meet people's needs. Um, that spontaneous order in the economic sphere is one example, but emergent order, which is the term that complexity scientists use, uh, is a very general phenomenon. It's one that in nature is in everything from you know ant hills and beehives uh, to certain types of physical phenomenon like. Uh, whirlpools or uh, often weather patterns. And so um, the the basic idea is that, again, the system, uh, because small individuals are used, are following their own simpler set of rules, create this complex order uh, of the system overall. The, the example I really like to use uh, is to contrast emergent order with, you know, what we might think of as chaos and then also with designed order is Think about you're at a baseball stadium and you're trying to predict as people come in the turnstile, like where they're, what they're going to do next. Um, that'd be very difficult to do. Uh, that each of them have their own uh, purposes and their own designs, but there isn't a, a sort of emergent property that comes from that um, as you follow what they each do individually. And so it can be very hard to predict. Uh, that's That's chaos. The emergent order example would be something like well, the designed order example would be something like at like a Alabama football game or something where everybody has a placard and they all hold it up at the, the right time and it says go team uh, or roll tide or whatever they say in Alabama. And and that's designed, right? Somebody understands how that system works. Everybody has their own little piece, but somebody designed that overall. The example of emergent order would be something like the wave. You know, you have a few people who stand up and try to get the wave going. Uh, and But everybody sort of judges whether or not to participate using their own heuristic. Do they have food in their lap? Are they excited about the game? Are they bored? The, you know, Are they tired? Um, and they decide. And then also, like, they decide, uh, do I stand up now? Uh, are people next to me standing up? And so it's a, they're all ver following their own set of rules that are relatively simple. But if you were watching the wave, you could generally sort of predict you could see the pattern, first of all, obviously, which is why it's so pleasing and, and fun to participate in. Uh, but you could also generally predict when somebody might stand up or might not. Um, and th that doesn't, uh, that doesn't even though there might be some people who instigated it, uh, they certainly don't control it, right? Once it gets going, it's kind of out of anybody's, any one person's control. It's certainly out of any one person's control. Um, but it sort and it can sort of peter out by people deciding, well, oh, something interesting is happening in the game, or I'm tired of doing this, or I'm less enthusiastic than I was earlier. Uh, and so that is a great example of emergent order where everybody is acting on their own, but there is a bigger picture pattern that emerges from those individual actions. It reminds me of the, I, which I think is probably an apocryphal story that I believe is about Calvin Coolidge of trying to determine um, where they were going to lay a, I think it was at a university at the time, where they're going to lay a sidewalk. And rather than pave it where they thought people would walk, they just let people walk on the ground as it was until a path was clearly established and they realized, well, this is the way where most people wish to walk to get from one place to the other and paved over that path. Nobody told them to do that, but the consensus just kind of formed that this is the way we'll get from this point to that point. And that's what most people did. And you learn from what people's actions were rather than trying to say, and you've, anybody who's seen, you know, a perfectly designed college campus or anything, you'll always find those paths where the students actually walk rather than right. the paved ones where they were expected to walk. Yeah. And, and often you don't even see that because what happens is they, yeah, like you said, they come behind and then after they did their perfectly designed plan, they just paved the spots that people actually walked. And so it looks like it was designed from the upfront, right? <laughs> but it wasn't, uh, it can be hard to tell. So what is, emergent leadership look like? 
Um, you know, I think we could probably, and anybody who's had a micromanager boss can understand what controlling leadership looks like. What does, what does effective emergent leadership look like within any of these complex systems that we're currently operating today? So, uh, I offer, you know, six principles for applying this principle in, uh, six strategies for applying this principle of emergent order to our lives. Um, and in the emergent leadership context, I would say the the key, some of the key ideas there around being humble about what you can control and also um, leading by example uh, and by persuasion rather than command. And so I think we often, I think if you ask any leader of a, a large organization, they will tell you that their actual control is somewhat limited. Um, and that a lot of their work is persuading people, setting big picture vision rather than uh, trying to control the day-to-day actions and, and setting the tone for the work and the, the big picture vision and then making sure that people have the tools and the resources that they need in order to pursue that vision using the local knowledge that they have. And so to me, that's the, the main um, the main principles of emergent leadership are around humility and decentralization and uh, providing a good example at the top. Um, some of the, the leaders that I talk about in the book, uh, General McChrystal in particular, he, he experienced this when he was fighting in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, the challenges of emergent leadership. And it's hard to imagine a more hierarchical and more control, I think at least the stereotype uh, um, organization than the military. But what he realized very quickly is that the the opponents he was dealing with, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq in particular, were outstripping them because they were decentralized and they had a long-term vision, but they didn't have a micromanagement uh, process that meant that every decision had to be made by leadership. One of the things I think is most interesting, and maybe this is a great lesson for emergent leadership, uh, I think it is from that, is McChrystal dealt with the problem that technology initially led him to grasp for more control. So the rapidity of communication that you were talking about earlier the developments in military communications technology meant that it was possible for him to get reports back and questions from the field on every decision. Uh, And initially he would take that on and he would jump up at all hours of the night in order to, you know, weigh in on a decision that was happening in the, in the field. And he realized that that, he was becoming a bottleneck. He didn't contribute much not local knowledge to that. He didn't. He was basically just vetting and um, you know rubber stamping the decisions. And while that might have made him feel good and powerful as a leader, uh, that it wasn't very effective and it was slowing down his teams a lot. And so, one of the lessons we can take from that is the need to see com- a technology, um, not fall into the trap of trying to of using technology to exert more control or to attempt to exert more control, um, because uh, it, that we could still, as leaders, be a bottleneck for our teams if if we're using technology in that way. And so, um, technology has, you know, it's it's kind of agnostic when it comes to centralization or decentralization. Um, there are certain technologies that centralize and there are certain technologies that decentralize, but we should keep in mind that the, the basic knowledge problem that Hayek talked about uh, is not solved by technology. The dimensions of it can be changed a little bit, but it's not solved. And, and we as leaders need to keep that in mind when we're figuring out how to interact with our, our subordinates, with our, um, you know, our employees and with the world outside of our organization. I want to come back to that 
point I think you're just making about the, the signal and the noise of all the information that can be coming back to you. But you, you've also reminded me of another military example that's one of my favorites. I got a presentation from a colleague years ago on the military concept of mission command. And one of the best examples of that is the Battle of Little Round Top in the Civil War, where Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is given one command from his general of what he's supposed to do on the flank at Little Round Top. And because he's run out of ammunition and he can no longer hold off the charging Confederates, he has them fix bayonets and charge down the hill. That was not what he was told to do, but it's what he understood because he was empowered by his superior to make those kinds of decisions on the ground. And arguably, he saves the Civil War for the North in doing so, driving the Confederates back down, holding the line, and leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg the next day. And that's, a, I think, an example of leadership empowering people closer to the problem. There's also a concept of subsidiarity there that – Chamberlain would better understand what he needed to do in that moment rather than following the dictate of somebody who pre-designed what the battle would look like. And clearly a general there who understood the, you know, the great axiom that, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Yeah, that's a great example. And, and uh, you're talking about him being sort of granted that flexibility to do it. But in some sense, the technology of the day didn't allow another mechanic, right? I mean, uh, he he sort of had to. You can imagine how much worse it would have been if he had to check back in with his general to decide. I mean, there might have been minutes or you know tens of minutes lost while the general was dealing with lots of other things. And if that was the structure, if it was technically feasible for him to get the sign off before he did something like that, but the speed might be affected, uh, you could see the paralysis that that might lead to. And I think that was McChrystal's lesson was even though it was technically possible for him to do such a thing, it was actually quite an impediment to the success of his team when he was serving as a bottleneck. And so uh, I love that example. It's a good contrast. I imagine it's probably a discipline is a major factor in a leader in that case to be able to recognize, especially because as you pointed out, th there was no real ability to quickly communicate from Chamberlain back to Grant, right? That was not going to happen. But now because of the rapidity of information and our connective technology and all of that, it is possible to do so. I think this also connects to the way that we have conversations about social media for people who point out negative trends emergent from uh, social media. Uh, to me, in my opinion, I don't think that it makes people act a certain way. I think it's revelatory about the way that people will act if given that opportunity. And there's a discipline factor there that we have to be able to discipline ourselves in order to, if you're in the leadership position there, um, to not be that bottleneck. How, how, you know, given the fact that you have all these tools at your disposal, how does one go about understanding their value, separating signal from noise, and disciplining yourself in order to empower people to make decisions beneath you in a leadership structure? Yeah, I think that's a really powerful question. The uh, One of the key principles in the book is that while there are few things that you have control over, the things that you do have, the few things that you do have control over is um, your decisions about what to do next. And and that discipline that you're talking about is something that you and I uh, and every individual can work to improve. And that can help make the, uh, the key thing to realize is that this doesn't just make our lives better when we do this. It also has an effect because of how complex systems work. It can often have an outsize effect that influences what other people do as well. And so, uh, in particular, you know, bad bad behavior uh, people pick up on, uh, but good behavior people pick up on as well. And so, I, I do think that as we're a part of a dynamic, a many different dynamic, complex, adaptive systems, our ability to influence by changing our own behavior is, I think, under underestimated by many people. Uh, instead, we often are looking for somebody else to make a decision to solve these things. In the social media context, we're often Maybe we're asking government or maybe we're ask, asking Mark Zuckerberg or somebody else to like make decisions that will help solve all the problems. And while they can affect the structures that are going on for sure, um, I think ultimately it is up to us to, we have the most control. We might have influence on those other people. But we have the most control over our own actions. And so one of the key strategies I think is 
seeing constraints as valuable uh, and building habits. Habits are one form of constraints that I think are really important to us as individuals. And so um, in the social media space, building good habits around how you use technology, I think is really important. If Whether that's setting aside time, uh, you know, the proper time that you're going to use it, whether it's setting your um, notifications in a way that doesn't interrupt your day or that is that you find disrupt uh, you find productive but I think mostly it, it's going to be different the the actual outcomes I think are going to be different and the strategies are going to be different for every person because not everybody has the same goals uh, or the same needs from social media um, but I think the key point is to be aware of what you're what you're doing online how how is this serving your, your bigger picture needs? Is the way you're using social media or is the way you're using a, a, a various technologies that actually serving your longer term goals? Uh, or is it, you know, is it, is it undermining them or is it just like not really having any effect at all? I think asking yourself that question uh, repeatedly and at a, a, a periodic pace, I think is useful to more thoughtfully using these very, very powerful tools. And ultimately, I think as we, I think we all know, right? It's easy to pick out bad examples of people, uh, people behaving badly online. But I often, um, there are some people who we also can look at and say like, oh, those people are very good at social media in that they react in a way that I find admirable and that they engage with people in good faith. And I think striving to be one of those people um, to make it a productive platform uh, I think that's that's worth doing. It's worth doing. It's not just abandoning these powerful tools um, is not, I think, the 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 best answer. It might be a good answer for some people, but it's not the best answer overall because these tools do have such potential. Um, but finding a way to be one of those people who other people look at and say, like, wow, that that person really is good at this uh, at engaging with other people um, and in using this platform in a way that. Um, builds up people and that builds up ideas and that creates good conversation rather than, um, you know, forming tribes and, and creating division, I think is, uh, that's something we should all strive to be honestly. I, I like your point about the value of constraints. So uh, prior to getting into the line of work I'm in now, I have a degree in music and composers will tell you that, you know, if you're told, write anything you want, that that is actually, in, in a way, oppressive. You have so many options available to you. Uh, but people in particular who are commissioned to write film scores are often given a direction of, you know, this is what we need. These are the parameters of what we need you to write. And within those parameters, the best creativity comes because you're given a space within to work and it unleashes the creativity given the parameters that have been set for you rather than having every option available. And sometimes you get, um, I, I played drums and sometimes, you know, having uh, too many, a smaller drum set makes you more creative because when you've got more cymbals and more toms and everything available to you, you feel the need to use everything available rather than limiting off and saying, like, these are the things I'm going to focus on. And constraints can be incredibly value in unleashing, I think, creativity uh, in, a, in a valuable way. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a section in my book where I talk about what's called the paradox of choice, which is based on some social science studies that were done at Stanford called the jam experiments, which were basically short version, uh, the mall kiosk with like three jams sold many, many more, uh, much more product than one with 30 jams because people look at it and they're like, I want to pick the best one, but I don't know which one's the best one. I'm overwhelmed with this. I don't have the time. So I'm just not going to buy anything. Whereas, uh, and that, that, that research has been, has become more nuanced over time. I think I uh, had some criticism of it, uh, but I think the general point stands um, that in a world with many, many choices, we, we have this, uh, what jo Joshua Rothman called um, YOLO plus FOMO, right? Like we, we, we know we only live once. And so uh, we want to get the best experience, but we're also like pretty stressed out because we're missing out if we don't uh, make a choice. And so we have this real tough, uh, this is the, the sort of modern experience when we're faced with many, many options about how to spend our time. Uh, and 
that's a tough problem. It's one that I think companies are trying to, you know, when you see Netflix, which is like now has like the watch something button where you don't have to like pick, you just hit it. They're trying to come up with options that like simplify this, but ultimately uh, it's, it's up to the best constraints are going to be ones, the ones that are best adapted to us are going to be ones that we set ourselves. And so thinking ahead about, you know, what we want out of an activity and saying like, here, I'm going to narrow down, Hey, I'm not going to get the full drum set today. I'm just going to see what I can do with, you know, three drums, uh, and, and, and experiment there. And then maybe if I need to add something else, I will, um, I think is a really good, a really good strategy for dealing with complexity of the modern world. So for people who aren't in leadership positions, people who are lower in that organizational structure, how do they embrace the same concept of emergent order within their roles within an organization? So I think the, the key principle that you can uh, you can improve the world by improving yourself applies to everybody. Um, we have great examples throughout history of people who were not in what we would consider traditional leadership roles, but who had a giant impact by making the right decision at the right time. And, uh, you know, I think the ex- one of the examples I use in my book is Rosa Parks and her famous story of, of uh, not moving to the back of the bus. Um, the interesting thing about that story is that Rosa was, was obviously part of a complex network of many other people who were, had the same ideas and, uh, and the same initiative, but she was, she was given the opportunity in this very small way to resist. And that provided a spark. She wasn't even the first person to be arrested, not even the first woman to be arrested for not moving to the back of, uh, the bus. Um, but, but her choice there did create the spark. The environment was proper at that time. And so I think what it means for each of us as individuals is that um, we need to take the values of the organization, use our local knowledge, and continue to pursue um, what we think is the right decision. Uh, and, and when those opportunities come up to act, uh, acting is really important. That uh, You could take from this emergent order idea that a sort of nihilistic, like, well, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm just part of this big complex system. So I'll just do what I want, like in the moment. And probably things will, if I'm meant to be famous, I will be. And if I'm meant to have a big impact, I will. But emergent systems don't work if the, if the actors, they don't work well, they're not suited to their purpose. If the people who comprise them are not acting in a way that's uh, compatible with that purpose. And so, so acting and acting in a principled way is very important to ensuring that our complex systems, and then this, I would, I would say institutions like our families, uh, our churches, our communities, and our, our nations, um, in order for them to work, we as individuals need to uh, embody the principles and the values that we want to see in those institutions. And, and so, that applies whether you're at the very top of the hierarchy uh, or if you're, you know, the, the person who's just entering a new institution at the lowest level. So you'd previously worked at the FTC and you know, I know many of us, uh, you and I both could probably look at uh, federal government and identify plenty of places that are not embracing this as a uh, philosophy for leadership, people attempting to control absolutely every element that they can possibly control. I'm curious, do you have examples either from your time or from uh, research of people embracing a more emergent order kind of leadership within in uh, government, within changing public policy? And you know, if not, uh, if there aren't clear examples of that that we can point to, um, where do you think within uh, the state would benefit the most from embracing this kind of a leadership approach? So I, I do, I, I had the great fortune to work for a um, political appointee, my, my boss, Maureen Olhausen, who really did embody many of these ideas. She often spoke of um, regulatory humility, the idea that regulators should understand the limits of what they are capable of doing and act accordingly. And that can really differ depending on what the regulatory sphere is. Um, but at the Federal Trade Commission, which is charged with uh, 
protecting consumers and promoting competition, uh, there are there were some good examples and bad examples. And so uh, overall, the FTC has a structure, and I, I think this is one of the key points I try to get across in my book. It has a structure of case by case enforcement, um, which is not what most people think of when they think of regulation. They often think of these big rulemakings that an agency like the Federal Communications Commission would do that sets out the rules for a whole industry and says, okay, this is how everybody can behave. And this is when you're crossing the line. This is when you aren't um, uh, in very specific, often micromanagey ways. That's that's a um, that type of rulemaking framework is a framework that reduces the ability of emergent order in an industry. And so, uh, what I saw, you know, I spent some time doing telecommunications law, where the FCC, the rulemaking agency, was my main focus. But then when I went to the Federal Trade Commission, I saw a very different approach, which is one of case by case adjudication based on some very general principles around unfairness uh, or deception, and there. What that looks like is much more like a common law process, an emergent process where there's these general principles and there's guidelines that the agency will issue from time to time. Uh, but then they will look at the specific facts in a case and say whether or not this company is behaving in a way that violates those general principles. Um, this is not a perfect solution uh, either. It is still the application of, you know, government force to uh, judge a, a situation, uh, which is necessary often, but can go awry when you have people making bad decisions. But the effects are much more localized, right? So they're, they're generally focused on a single company. And uh, they, rather than trying to set the rules for an entire industry, and in fast moving spaces, especially like technology, that type of approach means that you allow a lot of experimentation. You allow people to try to achieve the goals that we want, which you know, promoting, uh, protecting consumers, and and disrupting, uh, having disruptive competition, without tr having to specify how that happens. And in some ways, the agency was an example of one way to facilitate emergent order. Um, I do, you know, I do have examples in the book of where the agency got it wrong in a way that was trying to, um, uh, was, an, was an example of trying to seize control. And so one of the cases that I talk about is this case of uh, Nomi who did, they provided a service that would allow retailers to pay attention to how people in the aggregate move through their stores. So they could tell like whether or not, you know, people were going to this display over here a lot, or if they were spending more time, you know, in the center aisles or whatever. And that would help them understand basically what products people might be interested in. Very similar to how we might uh, track people when they're browsing through a website. Um, and they offered more than the law required around opting out. Uh, but because there was a sort of technical flaw in one of the um, one of the ways that they offered opt out, the agency brought a case against them. This is a brand new company that was producing something that would help like brick and mortar stores compete with online stores. Um, but the, and there was zero evidence of any consumer ever being deceived by what the company did, but the FTC brought like a full case against them uh, and uh, brought a full complaint against them and, and, and ended up settling with the company and the company ended up selling because it couldn't, um, you know, because that litigation cost them so much money that they couldn't be an ongoing uh, enterprise. And so uh, to me, that was just an example of um, an improper application of this case by case approach in a way that demonstrated the opposite of regulatory humility. It, it demonstrated a, a sort of regulatory arrogance about how the industry should develop in that space. And so um, I have several other examples, but um, uh, you know the short story is it's it's hard in a uh, an institution like government where all the often the incentives are very much to seize control or to at least be perceived as being in control. Um, it's hard to practice this type of regulatory humility, but I think in many ways it's more productive. Um, I know I've been going on for a bit, but there's 
there's a really good example of this in the uh, of from ancient, ancient more ancient times. Um, the start of German forestry was particularly interesting thing that the 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 uh, rulers wanted to increase the lumber that was coming out of the the black forest at the time, and. And their goal initially was just to measure how much uh, lumber was in the forest. And that measurement shaped how uh, the forest was treated. And so while the government only saw the forest essentially as providing lumber, obviously it provided lots of other uh, hunting, uh, medicine, lots of other properties for people who are not just the, the ruling class. But because they started measuring it for lumber, the, the, the forest became more and more focused on lumber production. And so what we ended up with was these very nicely planted rows of trees that were a monoculture, that were the best trees for lumber. And in the short run, it did ramp up lumber production a lot. But in the longer run, because it was a uh, monoculture, that meant that um, it was much more fragile, it was much more vulnerable to disease. And it also didn't serve the many, many other purposes of uh, you know, other people who were not the government. And so uh, this is a story that James C. Scott tells in his book, Seeing Like a State. And I think it's a good example of even well-intentioned government action, um, seeing through a very specific lens, uh, a resource or a industry and their shaping of that industry sort of being innocuous or not really intentional, but like the end result being not only counterproductive to the people who are using that resource or something else, but even to the purpose for which the government was trying to use it. And so I think there's not enough regulatory humility in government. Um, there should be a lot more. Uh, and hopefully my book will help uh, shift that a little bit, at least in the circles that I, I move in. For the people listening who are leaders in some capacity, they're a manager, they have a small business, they um, you know, run an organization, uh, what is the first step to embracing this kind of an approach to leadership? I know they can recommend, of course, reading the entire book um, and really getting a full understanding of it. But how do you take that first step towards embracing this as a mode of leadership? So I think the first step is to uh, look inside. That's what I would always say. The first step as a leader is to look inside and see how much of what you do daily is an attempt to take control. Um, how much of what you're trying to do is is exerting control or uh, dictating commands downward. Um, I, I think even well-intentioned people, it's, it's, it's so built into our human nature. Uh, we are tool building and planning uh, you know, creatures. It's so built into our nature to try to exert control um, that I think it, it, can, uh, it can be hard for us to recognize when we're doing it. So I would say that would be the first thing I would do, like sit down and think through you know, your past week how did I, how, when I was interacting with the, the people who are in my organization, when was I seeking to take control? And when was I thinking more about how I might influence uh, or shape the, them or help inform them of the values of the organization rather than trying to take control or control what they were doing with their time? Neil Chilson is a senior research fellow for technology and innovation at Stand Together, where he spearheads the Stand Together community's efforts to foster an environment that encourages innovation and the individual and societal progress it makes possible. He is the author of the book, Getting Out of Control, Emergent Leadership in a Complex World, which we've been discussing today. Neil Chilson, thanks so much for joining us today on Act Online. Thanks so much for having me. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.